replaced all of us, didn't she? Welcome to Ms. Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 Disney villains who were right all along. A rat infestation. It's taken over my rest uh, Gusto's restaurant. For this list, we'll be looking at antagonists in Disney and Pixar's animated films who are the most justified, even if misguided, in their actions. We're talking big baddies, henchmen, and problematic characters. As long as they're not the hero, they're eligible. We might spoil some plots, though, so this is your warning. If these characters are in the right, does that mean their corresponding heroes are wrong? Let us know what you think in the comments below. Number 20. John Silver, Treasure Planet And when the time comes, you get the chance to really test the cut of your sails and show what you're made of. Well, I hope I'm there. The cybernetic pirate may be in the dirty business of hunting treasure, but he's not a bad guy. Sure, he has an abrasive demeanor and he's greedy, but he also has a sense of honor. His principles include avoiding violence and harm whenever possible. Plus, he has his priorities straight. Near the end of the film, when he's given the choice between rescuing Jim or a bunch of valuable goods, he picks Jim. Oh, yes! Me for a boat! Ah! He clearly loves the troublemaker like he would his own child, and gives him support that Jim didn't otherwise get. He may be complicated, but at his core, Silver is good. Number 19. Morgana, The Little Mermaid 2 Return to the Sea The main antagonist from this Disney sequel is pretty horrible, but we understand her perspective. Not only is she an outcast from society, she also struggles with living in Ursula's shadow. Stop criticizing me! That's all my mother ever did was criticize me! It was always Ursula this or Ursula that. Apparently, their mother always showed a preference for Ursula. Her motivations are complicated. She's driven by a desire to both avenge her sister's death and to prove that she can do what Ursula couldn't, take over the kingdom. Sure, she's violent, but some might say that Triton and his kingdom had it coming thanks to their mistreatment of Morgana and Ursula. Not to mention, Morgana is only able to deceive Melody because the latter's parents, Ariel and Eric, kept her mermaid heritage a secret. I've given you what you've always wanted. She's the one who lied to you all these years. I was trying to protect you! By fencing me in? Number 18. Gabby Gabby, Toy Story 4 All I want is a chance for just one of those moments. I'd give anything to be loved the way you have. They say hurt people hurt people, and it definitely applies to this antagonistic doll. Although her actions are sinister, she acts out of a desire to be loved. Her methods are questionable, but desperate times call for desperate measures. Despite being roughly as old as Woody, she's never really experienced what it's like to be played with and adored by a child. For decades, she's been stuck in an antique store, her purpose as a toy unfulfilled. It's pretty tragic and totally unfair. Woody has had not one but two fantastic owners by this point in the story. Even he realizes that Gabby is deserving of a fair chance at finding one of her own. What if you're wrong? Well, if you sit on a shelf the rest of your life, you'll never find out, will you? Number 17. Captain Gantu, Lilo and Stitch Imagine this scenario from Gantu's point of view. As a captain of the Galactic Federation, enforcing intergalactic safety is literally his job. As far as he knows, Stitch is a destructive monster capable of wreaking havoc on Earth and in space. So Gontu believes capturing him is in the best interest of both the alien and human populations. This could be your chance to redeem yourself, Captain Gantu. How soon will you be prepared to leave? Immediately. Since Pleakley and Jumba are unable to recover Experiment 626, he's sent in as reinforcement, which explains why he comes in so hot. Sure, Stitch isn't actually evil, but he doesn't know that at first. And capturing Lilo isn't cool, but Gantu doesn't target her specifically. He's merely determined to complete his mission and ends up paying dearly for it. Grand Councilwoman, let me explain. Silence! I am retiring you, Captain Gantu. Number 16, Sid Phillips, Toy Story. All right, double prizes! 
Let's go home and play. <laughs> Sid doesn't deserve the hate he gets. Besides not being the best brother and ruining his sister's toys, he doesn't really do anything wrong. First of all, he's a kid. Second of all, he doesn't realize the toys are sentient. Some might argue that he's mistreating his playthings, but as long as they're his property, it's his right to destroy them. Because, again, he initially thinks they're inanimate. He's actually demonstrating incredible creativity with his play, as well as the ability to work in high-pressure situations. By taking the toys apart and putting them back together differently, Sid is developing skills folks like surgeons, scientists, and engineers hone. And these abilities can help him as he grows up. We toys can see everything. So play nice. <laughs> Number 15, Lotso Huggin' Bear, Toy Story 3. Lotso is a character who goes through something terrible and is fundamentally changed. After being lost and replaced, he grows jaded and ruthless. She don't love you no more. Now come on! We were lost. The strawberry-scented bear takes over Sunnyside Daycare and governs it harshly, to say the least. He's not kind, but he does what he does in an effort to maintain control of his life. Lotso felt secure as Daisy's toy and thought he would always be loved. When that's torn away from him, he finds a way to take charge. It's basically a trauma response. I don't know what you're talking about. Daisy? You used to do everything with her? Yeah, then she threw us out. No, she lost you. She replaced us. She replaced you. All he really needs is another child to love him, and he doesn't get it. Number 14, Danahi, Brother Bear. Although he's technically an antagonist, we don't think Danahi is morally in the wrong. The middle child believes not one, but both of his brothers were taken by a bear and seeks to avenge them. Danahi? Danahi, you found me! <coughs> you wouldn't believe what a nightmare this has been! Danahi? It, it's me, Kenai! The problem is that the bear being hunted by Danahi is his brother Kenai, alive and magically transformed. Luckily, Danahi realizes the misunderstanding before he's able to complete his mission. To be fair, revenge isn't everyone's cup of tea, and we certainly understand protesting the unnecessary killing of a creature. That being said, one could argue Danahi's behavior is somewhat justified. He's not an evil person. Rather, he's someone working through the pain of losing his family the only way he knows how. Number 13, Evelyn Dever, aka Screenslaver, Incredibles 2. Orphaned when she was young due to a hero-related tragedy, the tech-smart Evelyn doesn't trust supers, and we can't blame her. She imagines a world where regular people aren't dependent on superheroes, which sounds pretty good to us. While her ambition to keep the heroes illegal is emotionally driven, it is also kinda practical. Because you have some strange abilities and a shiny costume, the rest of us are supposed to put our lives into your gloved hands. That's what my father believed. Things can get complicated when vigilantes, superpowered or otherwise, take law enforcement into their own hands, which is essentially what Mr. Incredible and his pals do. She may go about things the wrong way, but ultimately, Evelyn was just trying to manage the weird power dynamic that exists between supers and regular people. The fact that you saved me doesn't make you right. But it does make you alive. And I'm grateful for that. I'm sorry, but she'll go to prison. Number 12, Shenzi, Banzai, and Ed, The Lion King. Kill him. These poor hyenas somehow get lumped in with Scar, but we think they're victims. They were banished from the Pride Lands for who even remembers what reason. Considering they were essentially left to starve by Mufasa, can you blame them for taking up with Scar? I will be king. Stick with me, and you'll never go hungry again. When Scar reveals his plan to kill Mufasa, you kind of get the feeling that they're not really into it. Instead, they're just desperate to return home. No way I'm going in there. But you want me to come out looking like you, cactus butt? 
But we gotta finish the job. Well, he's as good as dead out there anyway. And if he comes back, we'll kill him. And let's not forget that Scar is kind of a scary dude. Shen Z, Bonsai, and Ed are just a trio who backed the wrong guy and continue to obey at first for their own self-preservation. Simba, I am family. It's the hyenas who are the real enemy. It was their fault. It was their idea. Number 11, Ursula, the Little Mermaid. Banished and exiled and practically starving, while he and his flimsy fish folks celebrate. Well, I'll give them something to celebrate soon enough. Plant some! Get some! I want you to keep an extra close watch on this pretty little daughter of his. She may be the key to Triton's undoing. Ursula is definitely manipulative, but she never lies to Ariel. Ariel knows that Ursula is a sea witch and yet actively chooses to seek her out. What I want from you is... Your voice. My voice? You've got it, sweet cakes. No more talking, singing, zip. Now Ursula's eely minions did do some persuading, but there was nothing stopping Ariel from simply swimming away. Instead, she goes to Ursula, asks for her help, and willingly signs away her voice. Ursula never forced Ariel to do anything she didn't want to do. All the villain really did was give the mermaid exactly what she wanted, and then came to collect on what was owed to her when Ariel tried to back out of the deal. Let her go. Not a chance, Triton. She's mine now. We made a deal. Daddy, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't mean to. <laughs> <laughs> you see? The contract's legal, binding, and completely unbreakable. Even for you. Number 10, Edgar Balthazar, The Aristocats. Admittedly, it's kind of hard to sympathize with a guy who mistreats animals. But to be fair, Edgar's employer, who he loyally served for decades, was planning to leave an outrageous fortune to her cats. Edgar! You mean to say you're leaving a vast fortune to Edgar? Everything you possess? Stocks, bonds, this, this mansion, your country chateau, our treasures, jewels, and... Oh, no, no, Georges, to my cats. To your cats? Sure, it would have gone to Edgar after, but still. What the heck are the cats gonna do with all that money? Can you blame him for getting upset? They'll be gone. I'll think of a way. <laughs> there are a million reasons why I should. All of them dollars. Million. Those cats have got to go. Edgar definitely went about things the wrong way. But Duchess and her kittens never asked Madame Adelaide Bonfamille to leave them her fortune. They were just living their best cat lives. As for Edgar, all we're trying to say is that his frustration was understandable. You are going to... Timbuktu, if it's the last thing I do. His anger was just severely misplaced, and things snowballed. Number 9, Maleficent, Sleeping Beauty. I really felt quite distressed at not receiving an invitation. You weren't wanted. Not what? Oh. oh dear, what an awkward situation. What kind of middle school levels of pettiness is this? Are these monarchs really going to invite the entire kingdom over for their daughter's christening and exclude Maleficent? My gift shall be... Yeah, she's dark and edgy and doesn't fit the aesthetic, but considering her power and influence, the king and queen should have known better. <laughs> Now, the evil fairy definitely overreacted and misguidedly took out her anger on Aurora. But there's no denying that Stefan and Leah were being jerks. We're not saying that the king and queen were obligated to invite Maleficent to the party, but if they didn't want her there, maybe they should have kept it a more low-key affair. Don't invite seemingly everyone but her. Well, here's your precious princess. <laughs> Number 8, Robert Callahan, Big Hero 6. Hang on. We've invited all these people. We'll see. 
The pilot was Callahan's daughter. Callahan blames Cray. This is a revenge story. In spite of all the terrible things he did in his quest for revenge, you can't help but feel at least a little sorry for this guy. He thinks he lost his daughter in a tragic accident because of a colleague's careless eagerness to test an experimental machine before it was ready. Was my daughter a setback? Callahan! Did you... Your daughter, that... that was an accident. I... No! Oh! You knew it was unsafe. My daughter is gone because of your arrogance. In a fashion similar to his own personal villain, however, Callahan ends up causing the death of his protege Tadashi and becoming a villain in his own right. But Tadashi, just let him die. Give me the mask, hero. He went in there to save you. That was his mistake. And yes, he did terrible things after becoming the masked yokai. Still, Callahan wasn't really evil at heart. He was just a grieving father driven to madness. You took everything from me when you sent Abigail into that machine. Now I'm taking everything from you. Number 7. Yzma, the Emperor's New Groove. That's it, Grant. That's it. I'll get rid of Cusco. <laughs> the real Cusco? Huh? Of course the real Cusco. Don't you see? It's perfect. With him out of the way and no heir to the throne, I'll take over and rule the Empire. She is absolutely wild and, yes, evil, but that doesn't make her wrong about Cusco. He's initially a horrible emperor. When we first meet him, he's cruel to his people and only cares about himself. By the way, you're fired. Fired? What do you mean, fired? Um, how else can I say it? You're being let go, your department's being downsized, you're part of an outplacement. We're going in a different direction, we're not picking up your option. Take your pick. I got more. He lives in lavish luxury while his people struggle to make ends meet. And yet, Cusco spends much of the movie whining and complaining about how unfair his life is. He constantly puts Yzma down and neglects her skills and talents. He can't get rid of me that easily. Who does that ungrateful little worm think he is? No one would call Yzma's motivations altruistic, but you can't blame her for wanting to see him dethroned. Not the dinner. Do you know? Oh, right. The poison. The poison for Cusco. The poison chosen specially to kill Cusco. Cusco's poison. That poison? Yes, that poison! And considering she's seemingly the only semi-competent politician in sight, we can't help but wonder if she might actually have done a better job, even if her style proved a little much. Number 6. Shere Khan, The Jungle Book Let go, you big oaf! It's hard to look past the fact that he tried to harm Mowgli, but to be fair, his motives aren't completely incomprehensible. After all, he's a tiger. Why should you run? Could it be possible that you don't know who I am? I know you, all right. He thinks that men don't belong in the jungle because all they do is tear everything down. And when you think about logging, poachers, and forest fires, just to name a few man-made problems, this big cat totally has a point. Sooner or later, Mowgli will meet Shere Khan. The tiger? What's he got against the kid? He hates man with a vengeance, you know that, because he fears man's gun and man's fire. His grudge against Mowgli specifically is a little much, but you can't really deny his logic. He's just attempting to preserve his home. Bravo, bravo. An extraordinary performance. And thank you for detaining my victim. Uh, don't mention it, your highness. <laughs> Boo! <laughs> Let's get out of here! His willingness to target our young protagonist makes him an irredeemable villain. But if he reevaluated his methods, he could be seen as a heroic protector of the jungle. Number 5. Captain Hook, Peter Pan. Right here, Mr. Smee! Hold it, you fool! No! No! Captain? Oh, how dreadful! In the original version of this story by J.M. Barry, Peter Pan is actually a much more flawed character. And when you really think about it, he's not exactly a great role model in the 1953 Disney flick either. He fed Hook's hand to a crocodile and clearly took pleasure in tormenting the captain. Good for Mr. Smee. 
Blast good form. Did Pan show good form when he did this to me? I can't <laughs> Cutting your hand off was only a childish prank, you might say. Aye, but throwing it to that crocodile, that cursed beast like the taste of me so well, he's followed me ever since. It's one thing to hurt an opponent in the heat of battle, but to feed their hand to a crocodile is just plain malicious. The argument that Peter's just a boy doesn't really hold up either, because he's literally young forever, which just means Hook's pain is never ending. Well, well. A codfish on a hook. I'll get you for this pan if it's the last thing I do. Honestly, it wouldn't be hard to rewrite this story with the villain and hero roles reversed. Number 4. Hades, Hercules Hades and Zeus take sibling rivalry to a whole other level. Hades was banished to the underworld by his holier-than-thou brother. Just imagine how it made him feel to be all alone down there while all the other gods got to live in paradise on Olympus. Oh, Hades, you finally made it. How are things in the underworld? Well, they're just fine. You know, a little dark, a little gloomy, and as always, hey, full of dead people. What are you gonna do? We're not condoning his behavior. He did try to hurt the innocent Hercules in an attempt to overthrow Zeus, and that's a no. That whole thing where he released the Titans to destroy all of the gods because they neglected him was super petty, too. And now that I set you free, what is the first thing you are going to do? Destroy him! Good answer. But he just wanted a place on Olympus, and we can't help but feel for him in that regard. Number 3. Michael Goob Yagubian, aka Bowler Hat Guy, Meet the Robinsons. Game didn't go so well, huh? No, I fell asleep in the ninth inning, and I missed the winning catch. Then I got beat up. Afterwards, Coach took me aside and told me to let it go. Poor Goob. Or should we say Bowler Hat Guy? His juvenile, ill-intentioned schemes are motivated by the deep-seated resentment he has for his former roommate, Lewis. Kept up the night before by the sounds of Lewis's tinkering, Goob falls asleep during a baseball game and doesn't make a big catch. With his confident shot, the orphan grows up to be a loner who struggles because he hasn't processed his pain in a healthy way. So, yeah, his grudge makes sense. If I hadn't fallen asleep, I would have caught the ball, and we would have won! Do you understand? For some reason, no one wanted to adopt me. While he goes down a dark path, all he's really seeking is closure, which he deserves. Unfortunately, he gets taken advantage of by Doris and becomes a part of a plan that's truly evil. Number 2. Chef Skinner, Ratatouille We're not fans of how Skinner exploits Gusto's legacy to sell frozen food and tries to rob Linguini of his inheritance. That being said, we're on board with his efforts to keep rats out of a commercial kitchen. Kill it! No? No! Not in the kitchen? Are you mad? Do you know what would happen to us if anyone knew we had a rat in our kitchen? They'd close us down! To state the obvious first, it's a huge health violation. Who knows where those rat's claws have been? Not to mention, it's kind of unfair for Linguini to get credit for food he didn't technically make. Skinner taking Remy is a little much, but we don't mind him reporting what he sees to the health department. First opening is uh, three months. It must happen now! It's a call. Monsieur, I have the information. If someone cancels, I'll start you in. But, 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 but the rat! Gusto's famous restaurant closing is a sad consequence, but Remy, Linguini, and Colette seem to end up okay in the end. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Syndrome, The Incredibles this No, 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 you don't have to worry about training me. I know all your moves, your crime-fighting style, favorite catchphrases, everything! I am your number one fan! No one is responsible for the actions of others, but Mr. Incredible's treatment of this impressionable young man certainly didn't help matters. It was clear that this fan was in need of some guidance, and Mr. Incredible was totally patronizing, leaning into the elitist mentality of superheroes. Fly home, buddy. I work alone. It tore me apart, but I learned an important lesson. You can't count on anyone, especially your heroes. Even after supers became illegal, Mr. Incredible had this obnoxious air about him like he was somehow owed more because he was once a superhero. 
Syndrome's tactics are irredeemable, but the philosophy that drove them is a good one. Why shouldn't average people be able to be super? He was a champion of the little guy and believed in equal opportunity, using his intelligence to achieve it. After all, I am your biggest fan. Buddy? My name is not Buddy! <clears throat> and it's not Incrediboy either! That ship has sailed! All I wanted was to help you. I only wanted to help! If only he hadn't turned to such villainous methods. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from Ms. Mojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.